Okay, time to get going. Thank you for coming. This is a big and exciting weekend for Genomind. And um, it's sort of a coming out party for us. And we want to introduce you to our, our new product, which is called Genomind Professional PGX. And you see the collateral material behind me. I don't know if you know Genomind or not, but if you don't know us, I think you will know us by the end of the night. Our objective is to become the mental health company. So this evening, we, uh, we're fortunate to have an excellent speaker. And after I introduce everyone, we'll be hearing from Dr. Stephen Stahl, who's the chairman of the Neuroscience Education Institute, who will talk about the when, why, and how to integrate pharmacogenomic testing into clinical practice. And General Mind commissioned a CME course that's available to all of you, and there's cards outside that you can pick up for no charge. You can get an hour of uh, uh, CME credit if you follow this course. We had no input into the course itself. Um, and I think that course, that one hour course, forms the basis of Dr. Stahl's presentation. And then after that, we'll have a 15 minute presentation from Dr. Dan Dowd, who's the Vice President for Medical Affairs at Genomind. And he'll be telling you about the actual product. So a um, little housekeeping. Dr. Dowd and I are employees of uh, Genomind, and we are shareholders of Genomind. Dr. Stahl is a member of our Science Advisory Board. He's also a shareholder of Genomind. However, as I said, Dr. We, Genomind did not have input into the presentation tonight. This is a little bit of carrying coals to Newcastle. You all know these numbers, but the burden of mental health treatment is massive and growing. And depending on how you cut the numbers, one in five or one in six Americans are living with a mental illness. And furthermore, about 5% of Americans are living with a serious mental illness. About half of all adolescents will experience a mental illness during their adolescence. So these are pretty staggering numbers. I was on the phone with uh, some people who weren't mental health providers or even really healthcare providers we were having a business meeting, there were 10 people on the phone, and I presented this information that one in five people are living with a mental illness. And the person on the other end of the line said, do you mean two of us are nuts? <laughs> I said, no, it doesn't mean that, but it does mean that everybody on this phone call has been affected by some mental health illness. The economic costs, of course, are staggering and you see the numbers, and it's very likely that uh, right now depression is probably one of the top, or mental illnesses are probably one of the top three causes of hospitalization, and uh, it's growing, and by 2030, depression might be the number one uh, cost burden to, to society. I wanna tell you a little bit about Genomind before uh, we introduce Dr. Stahl. So Genomind is a a uh, laboratory company, we have a genetic test for psychiatrists and healthcare providers, it's called the Genesept assay. That version, version 2.0, is actually being transitioned to the new product as of Monday. So as of Monday is our official launch for Genomine Professional PGX. Genomine was founded by uh, Dr. Ronald DeZortz. Dr. DeZortz is here with us tonight. Um, and our mission is to bring precision medicine to psychiatry. So we really want to bring psychiatry into the 21st century. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't say just a few words about Dr. DeZoritz. And so I actually wrote this down, which is usually not my style, but I wanted to write something down. Dr. DeZoritz is the founder and chairman of Genomine. He's a graduate of the University of Buffalo Medical School, and he performed his residency at Case Western. After serving as lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy and entering private practice, he began an extraordinarily successful career as a business entrepreneur. He founded several hospital systems. He formed and led Value Actions, a leading behavioral health company. He's the trustee of Case Western Reserve. He's a trustee of Case Western Reserve University. He's been an advisor to several administrations on healthcare matters in particular mental health, and he's an emeritus trustee of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. 
Um, our values at GenoMind are derived from Dr. Desorets. And so we say, we try to live these I care values that you see on the screen. Dr. Desorets is an extraordinarily ethical, kind, and caring person. So I'd like to recognize Dr. Desorets. Would you please stand up for a second, Ron? We're also fortunate, gentlemen, to have an extraordinary scientific advisory board of leading mental health experts. And I won't go through all of them, but we did have a press release last week in which we announced that we were expanding our scientific advisory board and we wanted to diversify our leadership in terms of expertise, in terms of acad academic locale, and in terms of gender. So actually the three women on here were added to the our SAB last week. Of course, Dr. Stahl is a uh, member of our SAB. And Steve, I want you to note that this is the updated picture that you requested. Uh, just a little bit about the historic milestones of Genomine. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all this, but the company was founded in 2000 and nine by, by Dr. Desorts, and our first real commercial product was launched two years later. Um, in 2015, we built out our own laboratory in King of Prussia, and we're very proud of our laboratory. It's certified by CLIA, CAP, and New York State Department of Health, which is actually the latter being the highest hurdle. Um, if you look at the number of tests that we have processed in the last several years, you will see that there's asymptotic growth. So we went from 50,000 to 2015, or our 50,000 in total, to 100,000 in 2017, and this year we surpassed our 200,000th patient being tested by about 9,000 physicians. And I think this growth reflects the growth in the science, um, the change in the mental health community of providers, and frankly also the outstanding um, personnel that we have at Genomind, both inside in uh, King of Prussia and our field staff. When I was in medical school in 1980, uh, breast cancer was about the anatomy. How big is the lesion? How many lymph nodes are involved? What's it look like in the microscope? Um, and then if it was amenable, you did a radical mastectomy. Today it's about what is the biology of the tumor? What oncogenes are expressing proteins? Um, we can use your oncotype to predict a, um, a recurrence score. And the specific treatment is largely guided by the tumor genetics. So progesterone receptors, estrogen receptors, um, and so forth. And then uh, if you have HER2 positive tumor, you get a drug specifically targeted at that. We really want to move psychiatry into the 21st century. Obviously. Psychiatry is not where cardiology and oncology are, but that's where we're headed. And our tool is really designed to be another tool in your tool, tool belt to help you treat patients. So this graph is from a recent publication um, in which the authors looked at the relative efficacy of all antidepressants relative to placebo. And the interesting thing on this graph is that if you look at the effect size, the effect size goes from about one and a half to 2.1. So um, those are, that's a rather small effect size. Um, but there's not much to pick from from efficacy, but there's a lot to pick from from tolerability and from pharmacokinetics. And so how you pick your drugs might depend upon the patient's history, Maybe the patient doesn't want to, is afraid of certain drugs because of uh, fear of sexual side effects or weight gain. There's a lot of things that go into your decision, and it could be that genetics might be one of them. And not just for antidepressants, but for some second-generation antipsychotics, the dose can vary by a factor of eight, depending upon concomitant medications. So we want our product to be sort of a filter in which, in the beginning, we can't distinguish which patients are going to have safe and effective therapy, um, or safe but not effective therapy, or poorly tolerated and ineffective therapy, 
we want that filter to help you in your everyday practice. And I'd also be remiss if I didn't tell you our intended use. And so um, this intended use statement is on every Genomind test that you order. And specifically, it says this report is designed to be adjunctive to a complete patient assessment, including but not limited to proper diagnosis, clinical history, and so forth. So um, we recognize that it's an adjunctive tool. The most common misconception, at least among lay people, is that somehow this is going to be a diagnostic test or that this is, um, you know, the Oscars and you open up the envelope and this is the drug for you. And that's not the, it's not the case and we don't want to represent it like that. It should be a, another tool in your modern armamentarium. So, as I said, uh, we have had Genesep assay versions one and two on the market for um, about four or five years. And just to give you an idea of how it's been used in the market so far, if you look at the graph on the right, you see the age distribution. And I think the age distribution reflects real world. The greatest burden of mental health is on adolescents and young adults. And that's the most common use of the Genesept assay. And if you look at the diagnoses which we have in the 200,000 patients that we've tested so far, it's uh, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder account for about 90% of all the diagnoses. Again, the assay is not diagnosis specific. It's really to tell you about gene-drug interactions. Finally, I just want to tell you about one study which, which we did, which was a, uh, a case control study in a large payer database. Actually, it was the Aetna database. And the authors, Roy Perlis at Harvard and Hito Imbins, Hito Imbins at Stanford, used propensity match scoring. It so happened that between 2012 and 2015, there were a million patients in the Aetna database who had a mood or anxiety disorder. And several thousand of those patients had got the Genesept assay. So those patients were then matched to control patients, about three to one, and they were matched for gender, age, diagnosis, comorbidity, number of prior treatment failures, zip code, and so forth. And when the authors looked at the expenditures in the six months following genetic testing compared to the pseudo-randomized controls, they found that there were fewer emergency room visits, there were fewer inpatient visits. Uh, the outpatient visits were about the same. Now, interesting, interestingly, the difference in ER visits was accounted for by psychiatric illnesses. The difference in inpatient visits wasn't accounted for by psychiatric uh, diagnoses, but we all know that patients who feel better emotionally and mentally feel better physically as well. So th that's at least the putative explanation. We can't prove that. And there was about $2,000 less total health care cost to the system, specifically to Aetna, in the six months following use. So this is pretty powerful uh, data that was published in Depression and Anxiety uh, late last year. So um, that's going to wrap up my talk. Um, there's some anecdotes on this slide. We're very proud of what we do. I told you that CME credit is available, and this, this course should be available to you on Monday. Again, there's no, there's no charge. It's one hour of uh, CME credit for physicians or nurse practitioners. So that just leads me to introduce Dr. Stahl, uh, who is chairman of the Neuroscience Education Institute and a professor of psychiatry at UC San Diego. He's an honorary fellow at the, in psychiatry at the University of Cambridge, which I just learned means he can walk on the grass. He received his MD and PhD uh, degrees from, uh, North, he received an MD degree from Northwestern and a PhD in pharmacology and physiology from the uh, University of Chicago. Dr. Stahl has held faculty positions at Stanford, UCLA, and the Institute of Neurology, London. He's the author of 35 textbooks, and I'm sure that you're all familiar with uh, Stahl's Essential Psychopharmacology. He's authored more than 500 articles and is uh, one of the foremost psychopharmacologists in the world. 
In his spare time, he writes novels. Um, and most importantly, he's a member of our scientific advisory board. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Stahl. Thank you very much. Just one other thing, if you would just hold the questions till the end, I think that uh, Dr. Stahl, Dr. Dowd, and I will come up at the end and we'll maybe have 10 or 15 minutes of questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dowd. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for letting us uh, kick off your APA experience. We're going to have a good time tonight uh, talking a little bit about uh, the forefront of uh, psychiatry and intersection with that in psychopharmacology. So you can get a rerun of this if you're masochistic enough to want to hear the full part of it, because mine's going to be about 30 to 40 minutes. We have about an hour and a quarter uh, online at, at our uh, website for free. And so we're going to talk tonight about this subject. The who, how, when, why, who, 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 uh, the pharmacogenetic testing. So why are we doing this? This is controversial or it's glamorous. It's been trashed and it's been lauded. It's uh, turbulent at the cutting edge of new science. And so it's fun to be here and why do we do this and what's the state of the art and where do you think this field stands? Well, in order to answer those questions, we're gonna talk about the existing known polymorphisms, which means a change in one of the amino acids in a protein due to a change in a base in a gene, and what those are associated with both mental disorders and treatment. And I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to talk about diagnosis of mental disorders because we don't have any diseases in psychiatry. Anybody in this room treat schizophrenia? I don't. I treat delusions, I treat hallucinations, I treat, uh, you know, uh, symptoms. Anybody here treat depression? I don't. Uh, major depressive disorder has at least five of nine symptoms on a laundry list. You have to treat each one of those. And these symptoms cut across so many diagnoses. In fact, pop quiz, how many diagnoses are there roughly in DSM-5? Anybody know? Depending on how you count them, and some of them are redundant, Let's say 158. Did you know that? I have nothing to do in my spare time. Actually, I had Megan Grady, one of my writers, do this. And then I said, Megan, okay, I'm thinking about writing this book on symptoms in psychiatry and the genes that control them, the neurotransmitters that control them, the circuits that they're in, and let's see what big a task it is. So. If each diagnosis has three to 10 symptoms, I'm thinking, holy criminy, how many symptoms must there be? It must be maybe up to 1,000 symptoms. You know how many symptoms there are in the DSM? 79. Now, how can that be? It's because we treat symptoms. And symptoms are in different circuits. And different circuits, when they don't work right, can be put right by medications. And really that's the cutting edge of what genomics is doing today. It helps inform us as to what might be wrong with the circuit and therefore what medication you might use to put it right. Now, we're not gonna talk about diagnoses because that's not where it's at. We're talking about treatment. And we're not even talking about first line diagnoses. We're really talking about what happens when the easy cases don't work because I don't imagine anybody's in here to learn how to treat the 80% of first-line patients on every treatment guideline that the APA and everybody else puts out. That's not why you're here. They don't bother you, they're easy to treat, but that other 20% or whatever it is of the people who don't get well with the first treatment, they cause us headaches. When I stand up after a lecture or see people informally in the hall, everybody has two cases on their mind that's bothering the hell out of them. And They've tr failed all sorts of things. This is where pharmacogenomics comes in, is to help you rethink that case through, and that's really where the cutting edge is. So when, to be clear, we're not talking about diagnosis. We're actually not talking about first-line treatment. We're talking about treatment in people who don't obey the rules, because actually I'm sick and tired 
of the tyranny of the median patient. You saw those, uh, you know, those uh, forest plots that he showed of all the antidepressants, they looked about the same. Okay, now, let's say everybody in this room is, is depressed, so we're gonna give everybody the cheapest drug on sale because you're all the same, right? Your depression's the same diagnosis, right? Well, okay, we get away with that. It's probably cost effective, and 80% of you will be better or, or at least have some response. Um, what about the other ones? Well, you can go to hell. <laughs> because we don't care about you. There's no way to treat you. You just go next. Who, whoever gave you the last uh, prescription pad or the last uh, free cup of coffee, or I don't know how you choose the next one. So the reality is that we really don't know how to treat people that are bothering you, that make you drive you, come to the APA, come to a... Or a, I guess it's, it's a roast beef tonight, but I was going to say rubber chicken dinner tonight. That's why you're here is to figure out what am I going to do for those people? Because I don't treat median patients. I treat outliers, and so do you. And what you want to be is that little kind of naive Johnny on the spot person that says, I know this patient can get better. I'm waiting for the outlier, the person who has this extraordinary response, because we've all seen them. And the question is, how do you improve the odds that that happens? Well, I think it's in part pharmacogenomics. So we're gonna interpret a little bit of the testing data that comes out, in, including some of the ones that are in the test that, uh, that Genomine makes. So here we go, real quick. Now we're in college, we're at Genetics 101. What is this? It's a gene. Okay, got 23 and me of them maybe 46 of them, whatever. And um, that is the type of gene, the sequence of DNA, the billions of base pairs that you've got. The genotype is that, but the expression of the gene is called the phenotype. No. <laughs> what a horrible gene expression that must have been. And the generic variance between you and me I'm sorry to say, is less than a tenth of a percent. A scary thought if you ever had one. Oh my God. So really, the, and the difference between me and a chimpanzee is about 7%, although there are people who think it's actually closer. But, so it's really a very small amount of variance which is causing all the differences even between me and you, let alone between me depressed and me well. So we're talking about big time changes with our DNA that from very small amounts. So let's go through this. What's the path from your gene to your phenotype? The phenotype would be whatever you want to call it, blue eyes, but you could also say major depressive disorder. So the genes make proteins or modulators of gene expression. And proteins regulate the efficiency of brain circuits to cause or treat symptoms. Those 79 symptoms that treat every psychiatric disorder known to man. And when those circuits don't work right, they give expressions. So depending which circuit, because the brain is topographically organized. So you over here, see this circuit's going to go crazy here. This crazy circuit is not functioning right. It could be too high, it could be low, mainly it's out of tune. And when it's out of tune, the smiley face becomes something else. And the expression of anxiety, depressions, hallucinations is depending on which circuit is sick and how it gets sick and whether it's out of tune, too high or too low. And if you look at that circuit as a string on a guitar or a violin, anybody play a stringed instrument here? When you pick it up, it's out of tune. And how do you tune it? With your fingers on the tuning bar. But if you go too far, it's just as far out of tune as if you don't go far enough. And so what you and I do all day long is tune guitars. We give drugs that block or stimulate receptors and neurotransmitters that are, have the fingers on these circuits that regulate them. It's actually amazing that we can do as much good as we can, because really when you're giving a D2 antagonist or a reuptake inhibitor, you're throwing the brain into a bucket of this drug, it goes everywhere, but you're tuning it. And it's amazing because that's the basis of how everything in psychiatry works. But wait, there's more! Epigenetics. You know, we used to think that uh, there would be a gene for schizophrenia and a different gene for depression. 
Um, well, that's ridiculous. There's not ever going to be a gene for schizophrenia or depression. There may be, well, maybe 12 genes, or maybe there's a panel of 200 genes and you have to have 16 of them sick, but the 16 you have sick for your depression is different than the 16 he has, the 16 I have. And then you've got, oh God, this gives me a headache. And in fact, if you look at schizophrenia, the most recent studies say there's like 108 genes that really are, have a big time um, association with schizophrenia, big time meaning less than 1% of the variance. So that's already dizzying, but do you want to get a headache? You've got, you've got 10,000, 20,000 genes. I keep debating how many we got. Your normal genes cause mental illness as well as your abnormal genes. What? Because a normal gene that's on when it should be off or off when it should be on is just as bad as making an abnormal protein from a gene. And so that's where we get the epigenetics, which is the expression of whether a gene is on or off. And so if the gene is on, it makes its RNA and it makes its product. Or if it's silence, it doesn't do that. And that's got to be in synchrony or else things don't work right. And if I'm successful tonight, in every brain of every person at every table tonight, I have activated genes because you're learning and you're telling your old DNA, make me a new synapse, I'm going to make a new memory and I'm going to plug that sucker in and I'm making new proteins and synaptic vesicles and everything else. And that is experience, because the factors that express genes, normal on and abnormal off, would be your prenatal environment, your early life stress. This is one of the biggest ways you can change a normal brain, is early life. And those experiences that are adverse can almost permanently change a brain. Virus toxins, of course, substance use, even there are normal drugs, and yes, psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is an epigenetic drug. It's a, like teaching is an epigenetic drug. You're changing the brain's expression of genes favorably. So it's a little bit like London Bridge is falling down. If you have no risk gene, it's like here in San Francisco. What an apt analogy. Dr. Stahl has the Golden Gate Bridge. Now you think that that bridge is not a little bit over-engineered. In other words, they have a few more struts in there than they really need to keep it from falling down. Yeah, it's over-engineered. So if you put a little sports car across that bridge, that's not much stress. Bridge hardly notices it. You put a huge truck over it, it's still no problem. All right, let's take one of the struts out. Think it's going to fall down? Hmm, you think a sports car get across okay? Yeah, it's still okay. Even the truck gets okay. Oh, my gosh. How about two? Well, it's getting a little dodgy up there. The sports car will go, oh, the truck almost gets there, but now you've got multiple restines. Oh, my God, the bridge is barely standing up, and, and the, the truck, oh, the car will get over, but ah, I guess schizophrenia. So it's the issue of having the risk genes with the stress upon it that gives a mental illness. That's the model of every psychiatric disorders that we have. Does it tell you that the bridge is, medi is basically psychiatrically ill just because it's got struts out? No, any more than an abnormal gene is going to tell you whether you have something for sure. It's the combination of putting the environmental input together with the gene to tell you whether you have a psychiatric disorder and even how to treat it. So what's the relevance of the genotype? Well. How could this tenth of a percent variance help clinicians understand how a patient develops a mental illness or how they will respond to treatment versus another, especially when it's simultaneously mediated by epigenetic factors? Because of this slide, many people say genetic testing is dead on arrival. It'll never tell us that. There's, things are way too complicated, and you, know, you just can't tell it. But I think that's based out of uh, maybe not understanding it quite and also a little bit of just uh, ignorance. So the one thing that we can do to sabotage this gene test going forward is to be naive. If I would imagine people who are crazy enough to be here in this room tonight have an interest in this, maybe even are champions for it, maybe you're skeptics of it. But if you get your test results back, what we want to do is to make sure what they mean and, and do that accurately, because we don't want to have false promises. 
So congratulations, I got my gene test back from that fancy new test I just heard about five minutes ago. No, I got a definitive diagnosis, right? Eh. There's no known gene for any many psychiatric disorder or symptoms, and there's never going to be one. Oh, jeez. All right, well, I can pick the perfect treatment for you to know exactly what's going to work and what exactly is not going to work and what's going to have a side effect and what won't, right? Eh. Pharmacogenomic tests don't tell you that and never will. Well, now they're really useless, right? There's too much variance on a tenth of a percent, and it's not going to tell you this thing. And this is also the reason why people say this is just garbage and these are no good. Because if they don't tell you this, we're not going to pay for them. Well, wait a minute. What are the options? Oops, this thing is not moving forward now. There it goes. What is the old and classic model of psychiatric practice? Anybody like me trained last century? Actually, psychiatry has known the field of precision medicine before it became a term, before it was ever invented. We have practiced for a long time because we have treatment guidelines, certainly, in psychiatry, and it's based on evidence-based medicine. And so what's the evidence-based medicine? It's based on patients 18 to 65 who have no concomitant medical illness, who have no concomitant psychiatric illness, who do not have problems with uh, uh, tolerability of medications, who do not use substance abuse, have not a personality disorder, and who also uh, have never failed to respond to a drug, just like everyone in your practice. So if the light's shining down there, but my patient's over here in the dark, we tend to be like that bad joke where the policeman says why, why, to the guy who's a little intoxicated looking around under the street light, what are you doing, sir? He says, I'm looking for my keys I lost down the street in the dark. He says, why are you looking here? Because this is where the light's shining. <laughs> well, the light's shining is five or 80% of the patients or primary care physicians who treat psychiatry. But what about the people who have problems with responding to the first line treatment and where the guidelines don't exist? Other guidelines for your complicated patients, because they aren't for mine. So you have experience from training and practice, which actually helps you fill in those blanks. You've got your own intuition, God forbid. One of the coolest things about being in mental health today, I say over and again, is being in psychiatry, because it's the last field that combines art with science. You, you ever go to an internist? You don't get eye contact because they're taking care of their uh, electronic medical record and they're reading numbers off to you, right, for your test results. S surgeon doesn't even want to see you before or afterwards and you're asleep when they cut you open. Psychiatrist actually gives eye contact and actually listens to people and develops what's uh, a, an art of that, a feeling for that. Now the flaws of the old model, of course, were the thing called the recency effect. In other words, if I've just seen a yellow zebra I think there's lots of yellow zebras. If you don't believe this, buy a red Ford and then watch how many red Fords come down the road towards you. So there is a recency effect. Significant emotional event. If somebody gets really good after a drug or gets really bad side effect after a drug, you, it influences your odds of thinking of giving that to the next patient and shouldn't. Um, there's also eminence-based practice, which again is a flaw that some people like me practice, which there's <laughs> nothing about that. It's for the evidence, not eminence. <laughs> and what do you do when you have no evidence? And that's where pharmacogenomics comes in, because it's starting down the trail of giving you that evidence. So what pharmacogenomics, I think, can add to the modern model of psychiatric practice that makes you genetically informed, neurobiologically empowered, data-oriented, and it's a process I call equipoise. It's called weighing all the evidence. This is just some more evidence. It's not all the evidence. It doesn't tell you everything with one test. And you can practice without it. In fact, what evidence do you weigh? Say family history. Could you practice psychiatry and never take a family history? Yeah, I suppose so. Could you practice psychiatry and never talk to a uh, family member? Yeah, I suppose so. Could you practice psychiatry and not get pharmacogenomic tests? Yes, I suppose so. But the question is, is that ideal? I mean, I have a hard enough time figuring this stuff out with all the evidence I can possibly get my hands on. So I think it's important to 
weigh the evidence which then gets changed. It, it distorts things in the sense that new genetic evidence that says it's a little more likely you're gonna get better on this drug or a little less likely. It's a little more likely you're gonna have a side effect on this drug or it's a little less likely. Now some people think that's trivial, it's not worth the, the, the hassle, and they'd rather not have it. But I always tell my residents, in training for psychiatry, you should ask these two questions to your patients. Where's your daddy and who's your mama? <laughs> or maybe better, who's your mama and where's your daddy? What do I mean by that? So for example, where's your daddy or your mama means, uh, who's your daddy or mama, I mean, that means, you know, what, what's your family history? So you should get a family history on people. Could you practice without it? Yes. And then the other thing would be, um, you know, where's your mama? Usually it's a mama because uh, you need to get a woman in the office with you. It's an informant. Why? Because women make 90% of healthcare decisions, all their own, all their children, and almost all of their husbands and brothers and sisters. So if you go to a guy and you say, hey, have you had mania before? He goes, oh, no. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about. And if his brother or father was there, they wouldn't either. Find a woman. <laughs> and so you bring them in and you get that information because you triangulate, because the information from the patient, from your own lion eyes, and from that informant, if they match, then all of a sudden you have reinforcement and you know what you're doing. And I propose to you that that's equipoise and adding genomic tests, I'm gonna show you some more, do that as well. But you have to be aware of red herrings. In other words, it's possible, have you ever treated somebody um, for a different disorder than they had a family history of? Well, that can't be because family history always tells you what the disorder is, right? Have you ever treated anybody uh, uh, for a disorder that uh, they didn't admit they had? Of course, and you will treat people with genomic testing that says you have a little less likelihood that this drug will work and you give the drug and it does work. So you don't use any one piece of evidence to dictate your outcome. It's weighing the evidence. All the time, I'm faced and you're faced with contradictory evidence. That's what we get paid the big bucks for, is because you have all this mutually contradictory data. You still gotta make a decision by the end of the appointment, what are you gonna do? And this says yes and this says no. Well, figure it out yourself. That's where genomic testing comes in. It helps us add. So it's a strategy for where there's no evidence from large randomized controlled trials or if there is such evidence that it's all failed. Now, smart ass, what do you do? Right? That's what patients look at you. So the modern treatment of psychiatric practice is, of course, exhaust your evidence-based solutions first. No one would say otherwise. Then the thing that doesn't happen is after you exhaust it, the best thing for you to do is panic. <laughs> so usually we don't think. What we do is to say, holy crap, well, what else haven't I tried? Or what did I just read in the journal? Or whatever. What dinner did I just go to? And here's a stall are you chirping about. Well, I'm going to throw that at the patient. That's no way to make a decision. And I think pharmacogenomic tests help you think. And so the idea is take another history. Because um, what I found is it's possible that when you see a patient and they're not getting better on this drug and you give them another one in that class and they're not getting better and they're giving another one in the class and not getting better, then all of a sudden this kind of profound thought comes and the, the curtains part and my insight goes and I say, it's time to take a history. You know, like three years later after I treated the patient, right? Because we miss stuff and that is useful. I'll bring in another informant. Um, Treatment-resistant depression could be bipolar with mixed features. It could be pseudobulbar affect. It could be dementia. There's, we make mistakes all the time. Rethink it. Collect new data, including genomics, um, and use this information to rebalance the evidence and come to a genetically informed, neurobiologically empowered, novel, and rational combination rather than something that's a product of panic. Think it through. And if you, th yeah, I've told this to Ron, and I've told this to Gene of mine, I've told this to people who ask me whether I use these tests. What's the value of them? I think it's, it forces you to think. And maybe much of the evidence that you see from these tests is basically information that makes you rethink the patient and come with the most rational thing for them, given all the information at hand. 
And of course, it's still betting because we do that and patients still don't respond. But I think they get better responses and I think when you see genomic tests being used in some population compared to another population that didn't get it, part of the value of it in the population that did get it, in my opinion, is the people got the test, they had to stop and think and wonder of all the possible options, is there something rational that follows from these tests? So here's the modern model of psychiatric practice for the treatment resistant patient, particularly in depression, but it's any kind of treatment resistance. It's nature plus nurture, the genes plus environment equals the psychiatric phenotype, in other words, the symptoms that you're having. And we treat symptoms, not diagnoses. And their super model of psychiatric practice is to put pharmacogenomic testing together with therapeutic blood levels, with neuroimaging testing, the patient's history of symptoms as they relate it, the patient's history of treatment as they relate it and you can document it, family history, and then get that woman, that informant, put it all together. And today that's sexy, it's called personalized or precision medicine, and I bet everybody in this room has been practicing that since you went into this field, because that's what psychiatry is, and we add more and more as time goes on. So what's interesting to me is that um, I'm gonna give a symposium, and not really give, I'm gonna chair it, it's some colleagues of mine from all places, Turkey. So in this thing, I have a, you know, 90 minutes, three different talks that I'm chairing, that they're giving the talks on precision medicine. And they're talking about quantitative EEG, they're talking about therapeutic blood levels, and they're talking about genomic testing. And when um, I was fortunate enough to be uh, brought to Turkey and I got an honorary doctorate from the university that does this, and I thought this Turkey, well, you know, whatever. You had the most incredible psychiatric hospital I've seen, you know, in a long, long time. Now, of course, these are rich Russians and rich Arabs and, and rich Uzbekistanis and whatever that are going to Turkey and getting this, but they have incredible care and they all get this. They all get tests that Americans don't get. Um, and it's really pretty eye-opening. And I, I'll go into a little bit about therapeutic drug monitoring, which I think is also a neglected thing as well. So now you have the test results and the question is now what? Pharmacogenomic testing and psychiatric practice, the current state of the art, is there's a dozen or two well-studied SNPs of which you can get uh, the genomine test. Some are replicated extensively, others are not. And in fact, one of the frustrating things, if you actually are a scientist in this area, is every week a new study comes out. So you've got four tests in favor of this drug working and two that are neutral and one that's against. Then the next week there's another one in favor and three weeks later there's one against. It's always the balance of the evidence because it's not black and white. Each SNP has effects that are weak. There's no SNP that's gonna give you major depressive disorder and no SNP that's gonna tell you which drug's gonna make you better. There never is and there never will be. It only has maybe a percent, one percent of the variance. And or maybe in the future we'll have 100 or 200 tests and we'll be able to put it together in AI or something and figure out you know, exactly what's the best for you. In the meantime, we're capturing a dozen or two of these SNPs and doing it in the way in which we'll kind of go over the test results at the end. These are neurobiologically plausible. You know, if people were talking about keratin in your toenails that was changed that would make your antidepressant work or not, that wouldn't be biologically plausible, right? So what you have, though, are neurotransmitters and their receptors that have er variations that seem to sort with these things. That's how we think we tune these circuits and how our drugs work. So it's plausible that changes in those could help predict what gets used and what causes a side effect. Uh, there's always the danger of overinterpretation by patients or eager, unsophisticated, but well-meaning clinicians. But they're useful in developing these rational hypotheses for novel treatments or combinations of treatments in patients who are resistant to multiple agents. So that's where I think the real value of it is. The other thing it does, it gives hope and enhances optimism, motivation of prescribing pres uh, clinicians and provides a scientific basis. If it is somewhat weak, each one one percent, and it's still evolving to selecting agents. And so this is where we stand today, for better or for worse. And I think that the balance of the evidence still means it's worthwhile getting this information over not getting this information. I think it's where modern psychiatry is headed. Have you ever uh, 
other also to know something about it. Have you ever had this thing go in where somebody goes to you as a new patient, uh, referred from several other, and slaps down these test results and say, what the hell does this mean? And they already have had the gene testing and they just put it in your face. Anybody had that happen? So that's happening more and more frequently. And, and some of my friends who don't know what they mean really decide, well, but the easiest thing to do is to, to not admit that. So I'll say, these are, this is bullshit or whatever, you know, leave it alone, don't talk about it. But the reality is that um, it's, it's out there. And one nice thing about this, your cholesterol will change every time you measure it, but your genotype will not. So I always make sure that the patient gets a copy of it. And you say, what is going to change is not this gene, but what we know about it is going to change. It might even change by tomorrow and over the next five or ten years. And you may have a lifetime of this illness, and your family members may have it. This, this could be valuable information to keep on track. So what are the genetics of drug metabolism? If there's an area where it's more valuable, and even some of the skeptics and even some of the payers are believing in it, it's where you're talking about metabolizing drugs. And you can go from poor to intermediate to extensive to ultra-rapid metabolizers. That's the genotype. And the way you can figure that out by phenotype is the blood level. Now, although I'm really championing myself genotyping more for treatment-resistant depression, we use much more of the blood levels in, in our place and actually in this really incredible hospital in Turkey for psychosis because Blood levels will tell you whether the person, if they're not getting better, is what you call a pharmacokinetic failure. What does that mean? That means they're taking the drug and not getting enough in, and that's easily fixed. It's called raise the dose above normal, and then get the blood level again, and you would be amazed. Maybe, I would say, 15%, not, not half, but a significant minority of people have that simple problem. And of course, if the levels are normal and the patient still isn't getting better, it's called a pharmacodynamic problem, and you probably have to change the treatment. So we can get both genotypes, which predicts phenotype, and the phenotype. And if you actually have somebody with a funny level, it's a very good idea to get your genotype because you can predict why they did, and the next drug they take, you're going to be able to know whether you're in trouble or not. Now, that is not rocket science. Is there's tables to help you out? We actually have them for you in, in, in these uh, uh, you know various uh, appendices and in the tests that you heard about today. But wherever you get it from, you should know something about genotyping the way your liver eats drugs. And occasionally you can get at least with selected agents uh, therapeutic drug monitoring. It's coming back, I think, for treatment resistance. So what are the practical implications of testing the pharmaco? kinetic genes? Well, if you're a fast metabolizer, you have low blood levels, and if you have treatment resistant, you're probably adherent, but may require very high oral dosing or alternate routes of, of administration. If you're a slow metabolizer, by contrast, you'll have the opposite, high blood levels. Often people stop their meds because they can't stand them. They have side effects. And they might be adherent, but they may require lower than normal you know, I, I can remember the first time that I felt so foolish uh, is when the, some of this came out, there, you know, these, uh, say, 2D6 uh, poor metabolizers, which is like 15% of Caucasians. And I was at Stanford last century in my training and thinking this person was a crock, okay? You give them all the small amounts of drugs, side effects, side effects, side effects. There's no way that 25 milligrams or 10 milligrams of a tricyclic, back in those days, we had tricyclic antidepressants. That's not something your daughter rides. It's actually a drug. So, and then we actually were able to get this highly experimental thing called a blood level. And we, this patient had sky high levels at very low doses. You think, oh my God, he really wasn't, a, you know, making this stuff up. So you will see that. Not the most common solution to your problems and mine of treatment resistance, but it's takes some of the weight off and already helps. How about the pharmacodynamic genes? Well, here's where more controversy exists because it is still uh, you know, in development and also it's only a small amount of what you call the variance or the cause of anybody's treatment resistant. So you got the famous serotonin reuptake pump or transporter, sometimes called CERT, and the gene for it is listed there. And that gene comes in different 
sizes and shapes. And if the activity is high with the form of gene that you've got, that means you make more copies of the transporter. If you make more copies of the transporter, what's going to happen to your reuptake? It's going to be high, and if you have a lot of reuptake, what's going to happen to your synaptic serotonin? It's going to be low. On contrast, if you have the type of gene that makes fewer copies with less reuptake, serotonin levels will be high. And this does seem to interact both with diagnosis and with treatment. There are numerous studies suggesting that if you have the S form of this gene, you have more likely to get sick in a whole bunch of studies under stress. The gene doesn't by itself cause anything. It's like the Golden Gate Bridge with the strut out. But you put enough stress on it and you'll get depression more often than somebody who doesn't have that gene. If you're Caucasian, what's interesting is that the S form is in the minority in Caucasians and uh, Northern Europeans. And most of these studies were done in the US and in Northern Europe. And so all these came out and the next thing you know, I, I was actually in Japan and a Japanese guy comes up to me and he says, oh, Dr. Stahl, what do you think of these tests? I said, oh, they're very interesting. He says, uh, do you know that the uh, majority of Japanese people are S? And uh, they don't have any more sorting for depression in that group under stress. So you have to also factor in ethnicity. And actually, I'll just give myself another plug. I'm working with another uh, person to chair a different symposium on ethnicity in psychopharmacology because your genes and even the things that go along with that, like actually your habits and your diet and things that go, that, you know, that tend to sort with different cultures can change your relationship. So the bigger effect is in whether an antidepressant works or has a side effect in Caucasians. And so it is true that certain forms of the allele will do that. Now, not to go through the details, but just to summarize this very quickly, what's the practical implication when you get your test back? If you have the S or the L sub G allele form of the serotonin pump and a history of treatment resistant depression, you are going to be less likely to respond to a serotonin reuptake inhibitor and more likely to have side effects. Does that mean you will never respond to another one? No. But chances are you get this and you're going to have a patient who's had four of these guys already. And so it wouldn't take rocket scientists to say maybe the next time I give a drug for this patient it shouldn't be another serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And uh, that's what it means and that's useful information and you may go against that information but it's useful to put in the formula. There's a couple of different forms of the dopamine 2 receptor. Um, one is called an insertion form and one's a deletion form. And it's the promoter, not actually the gene itself. So it tells you if you're gonna make extra copies. So depending on which form you have, you have more copies of the D2 receptor. And the kind of information that comes out from that biology is studies like this. And this is also the very frustrating part of the study. The blue triangle is supposed to be where your eyes look, but if you're a skeptic, you would say, hmm, we got two of the studies at the bottom, which are on the one side of the curve, and the lines touch the, the, the horizontal line. So if, you're, if your vertical line touches uh, your horizontal line, it's the same thing as, as no change at all. Meanwhile, you've got two other ones where the square dot is on the other side of the line, but the long horizontal line touches the vertical. Those things were nothing, it means nothing's happened. But you've got two of the boxes that are not only on the left-hand side of the line, but they don't touch the vertical line. And you put them all together, you get the blue triangle. So is it a slam dunk? Everybody got better and they got a whole lot better if you had the one form of the dopamine receptor? No. But the practical implication is this. If you're thinking of giving an atypical antipsychotic augmentation to somebody who has treatment-resistant depression versus the other kinds of things you could do for them, and they have the delete allele, or copy means allele, 
and a history of treatment resistance, maybe you're less likely to respond to that antipsychotic, so maybe you just want to go away from that. And on and on. So I'm just going to go through another one. The alpha-2 receptor, interesting in ADHD. If you have one of the copies of the G type, you may be more likely to respond to stimulants than if you don't. Here's an interesting one. There's two genes that can help you about whether you're going to get fat or not. Then it's the serotonin 2C receptor and the melanocortin 4. And if you have certain types of those two receptors and you're on an antipsychotic, you might be more likely to experience weight gain. So you know what? I don't know what you're doing now, but I was telling you I do some consulting now for the state hospitals. Our famous most favored drug there is still olanzapine because we think it works a little bit better. But we're aware, of course, of the toxicity of olanzapine. So how do we resolve that dilemma? Well, we have violent patients who, who really have big time needs to have their psychosis under control. But the other thing we do, you walk in there skinny as a rail and you start olanzapine, you get metformin, especially if you have one of these genes. Because pop quiz, what does metformin do? Prevent weight gain better or make you lose weight better? It makes you prevent putting the weight on. So it, maybe you want to give anybody with certain atypical antipsychotics metformin anyway. That's becoming the standard. But clearly, if you have the high-risk drugs, and particularly if you have the high-risk genes in the drugs, you might consider that. There's also two genes that have to do with excitatory neurotransmitter neurotransmission. There's the calcium channel. And if you've got a certain form of that, you might be more likely to have bipolar. So if you're chugging along giving antidepressant after antidepressant after antidepressant, nobody gets better, and all of a sudden you either get this or you get this one, you say, holy crap, maybe this person really is bipolar and I need to actually stop the antidepressants and give something else, like a mood stabilizer, lithium, or some of the atypicals. So in summary, I would say that genetic testing adds to the balance of the evidence, the equipoise, when making treatment decisions. It may be especially useful for patients who do not respond or tolerate a drug as expected. Caution is essential when bringing genetic testing into the selection of treatment in clinical practice, and it does help you think instead of panic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stoll. So Dr. Dr. Stoll has made a career out of making psychopharmacology accessible to thousands of people. He's doing the same thing now with psychopharmacogenetics, so thank you. And now I have to follow that. So D David Krauss set this, set this whole platform up here, and he said, you're going to go on after Dr. Stoll. I said, uh, I'm not going on after him. Have you heard him speak before? There's no way I'm going on after him. But here I am. So. Uh, my name is Dan Dowd, and I'm going to talk about our new baby, which is called Genomine Professional PGX. Um, how many people in this room have used Genesept before? Okay. So you're not allowed to say Genesept anymore. Okay. Gen Genomine Professional. They dock us a week's pay if we say Genesept now. Our new baby here is Genomine Professional uh, PGX, if you'd like to call it GenPro PGX. That's what we sort of call it internally. And so the first thing I'll do is we've been talking a lot about genetic testing. We like to think of ourselves as more of a, a platform or a service than just a genetic testing company. So I'll spend most of uh, my talk talking about GenPro PGX. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about software that we developed called GDIG. Um, and GDIG marries your pharmacogenetic results to drug-drug interactions. And I'll show you some screenshots of that later. And then last but not least, we'll give you a sneak peek into a product um, that we're developing also called um, the Mental Health Map, the Genomine Mental Health Map. And maybe, maybe next year we'll, we'll be talking about that. So if you've used our test before, you're familiar with many of these genes already. Uh, you may not be so familiar with the ones that are underlined. 
And you can see them here, HTR2A, which is serotonin 2A, also HLA-A, HLA-B, most people are familiar with those. Uh, those are genes related to toxicity, in particular skin reactions to carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, et cetera. And Dr. Stahl talked about a lot of these other genes up here. So these are our pharmacodynamic genes. We also have some pharmacokinetic genes, or PK genes. Your CYP450s, for example, kind of your classical pharmacokinetic gene. But there's three new kids on the block, too. And the three new kids are one gene called UGT1A4, one called UGT2B15, and another one, which kind of is in a, a world of its own, called ABCB1. And these are our new pharmacokinetic genes. I'll go into more detail on them in a second. We'll start with the brother and sister, UGT, UGT1A4, UGT2B15. So let's go take it all the way back to Psychopharm 101. Um, there's two stages to drug metabolism. There's phase one and phase two. Most of you are familiar with phase one because that's all of your CYP450 drug metabolism. That does most of the heavy lifting. So CYP450 does most of the metabolizing. But phase two, for some select drugs, phase two metabolism is important also. And one of the enzymes for phase two is UGT. And we test two of those genes now. Um, if you want to know the formal name, there it is. UDP glucuronosal transferase, UGT. If you forget everything else that I said about UGT, remember this, UGT1A4 is responsible for lamotrigine metabolism. So most medications will go through both phase one and phase two. Um, olanzapine is a good example. Gets metabolized by CYP1A2 in phase one and then UGT to a lesser extent in phase two. Lamotrigine is a bit of an oddball because lamotrigine is completely dependent on 1A4. And some of us happen to be fast metabolizers at 1A4. So a standard dose of lamotrigine ends up with about 50% lower serum levels. So that's a clinical utility for 1A4. 2B15, which is the sister of 1A4, metabolizes the benzodiazepines, some of the benzodiazepines. Most of the benzodiazepines go through both phase one and phase two. The two oddballs in that family are oxazepam and lorazepam. They are both completely dependent on 2B15. Some of us are intermediate metabolizers at 2B15. So guess what that means? Higher serum levels of oxazepam, lorazepam, and to a lesser extent, diazepam, clonazepam, temazepam. Okay, so phase two enzymes. Less of an impact than the CYP450s have, but for some select drugs, a clinically significant impact. Okay, so let's switch gears now. Um, CYP450 breaks down drugs. UGT breaks down drugs. The gene we're going to talk about now, ABCB1, you may know better as P-glycoprotein. Does that, does that ring a bell? So PGP. This has nothing to do with drug metabolism, but everything to do with drug absorption. Okay? And not just intestinal absorption, but blood-brain barrier absorption. Because no matter how, how much of this medications we get into our bloodstream, if it doesn't get into your noodle, it doesn't do a whole lot of good. And ABCB1 is one of those genes responsible for how well we absorb select medications. And so if you know nothing about PGP, I like to describe it as a, a revolving door. And you can see the red PGP symbol right there. Imagine that is your blood-brain barrier, the lump of fat that surrounds all of our brains. Some drugs get through it very easily, but when they do, PGP acts as a revolving door and kicks it right back out. So PGP comes along and says, in this example, morphine. No, 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 morphine, get out. You can't stay here. So PGP basically surrounds your most sensitive organs. I would, I would consider the brain a fairly sensitive organ. Going back 
to this previous slide here, look where PGP is concentrated. Concentrated around your brain, small intestines, liver. If you're a male, testes, I would consider them important. If you're a female, a pregnant female, the placenta is loaded with P glycoprotein. So PGP protects sensitive organs by spitting out toxins. And as far as your body is concerned, morphine is a toxin. Venlafaxine is a toxin. Escitalopram is a toxin. Amitriptyline is a toxin. And PGP, or all of those drugs, are sensitive to PGP. So genetically, some of us make normal amounts of PGP. Some of us underproduce PGP or make dysfunctional forms of PGP. Those of us that have the dysfunctional genetic variants, well, guess what? We are more sensitive to certain medications. We absorb them better. They get into our noodle better. Greater sensitivity to select medications. And the report says clear as day what those medications are. They don't fall across the normal boundaries. Some SSRIs are sensitive to PGP, some aren't. Some tricyclics are sensitive to it, some aren't. Some opioids are sensitive, some aren't. Some second generation antipsychotics are sensitive and some aren't. And we state clearly which ones are, which ones are not. Okay, HLAA and HLAB. Both of these tell us a similar story. What, is, what, is the, uh, what are the odds of sensitivity to a skin reaction with carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine or phenytoin and maybe lamotrigine and maybe eslacarbazepine? Um, we'll start with HLA-B because that is the biggest risk factor between the two. One thing you should know about HLA-B is that it's only been detected in those of Asian ancestry. About anywhere from six to nine percent, um, maybe three to nine percent of Asians uh, carry this HLA-B risk gene. And if you do have the HLA-B risk gene, your increased risk of Stevens-Johnson or severe skin reactions can be up to a hundredfold. So Stevens-Johnson's is rare to begin with, but if you carry this risk gene, it is a significant increase in the risk of skin reactions. HLA-A is found across all ethnicities. About 13% across ethnicities will carry this HLA-A genotype. Um, it tells us the same story, sensitivity to carbamazepine. Um, let me take a step backwards to HLA-B. In addition to carbamazepine sensitivity, uh, it's associated with oxcarbazepine sensitivity and phenytoin um, sensitivity. Lamotrigine also, but to a lesser degree. You see those blue links there? Um, click on them. Anybody ever heard of CPIC before? The Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium. That's a mouthful, so they call themselves CPIC. Um, they're a group of a consortium of researchers that are starting to standardize the field of pharmacogenetics. So if you haven't already clicked on that link, that brings you directly to the CPIC guidelines. So there are CPIC guidelines for HLA-A and HLA-B. In addition to FDA drug warnings right in the label that says if you have this gene, do not initiate these medications. Last but not least of our new genes is one called HTR2A or the serotonin 2A receptor. And this is another gene that estimates response to different classes of antidepressants. So this is kind of a funny one because it tells us different things about different drug classes um, all with the same genotype. And if you're one of the 10% of the people who have a particular version of this gene, you are slightly more likely to respond to citalopram. Probably escitalopram also, but all this data comes from STAR-D, and STAR-D used citalopram only. So you're slightly more likely to respond to citalopram, but less likely to respond to everything that's a non-SSRI. 
So the SNRIs, the tricyclics, Welbutrin, uh, Mirtazapine, in 10% of the population, they are less likely to respond. The difference between these two groups, the odds ratio was about threefold. So you're about three times less likely to respond in one group than the other. So that's all of our new genes uh, on the report. Um, these genes still cover all of these standard uh, types of patients you see. So treatment for mood disorders, treatment for manic patients, psychotic patients, ADHD, opioid sensitivity, going back to ABCB1 and P glycoprotein. Certain opioids are affected by that. Morphine is one of them. Um, and we didn't mention them, but there's uh, genes related to uh, response for alcohol abuse, for the treatment of alcohol abuse. Not risk of alcoholism, but um, odds of response to certain treatments for alcoholism. So those are our new genes. Uh, now I want to introduce you to some of the new, sort of the facelift that the report got. Um, if you used our report before, you know there used to be a series of, of check marks, and we had, uh, we had some mixed feedback about our check mark system. So the check marks are gone. And we've replaced that now with bodies of text that are more informative than any single check mark would have been. So as you see here, Take citalopram, for example. Um, we still have the caution icon and the, um, the therapeutic options icon. Um, what used to be an orange check mark or a blue check mark now actually spells out what is the association with this gene and this drug. In this particular example, the cautionary check mark for citalopram says lower odds of response or remission and increased side effects in Caucasians. Beneath that, you have just the opposite in Asians, so higher odds of remission or response in Asians. So Dr. Stahl mentioned um, pharmacogenetic ethnicity earlier in his talk, and that's something that we're addressing now in the report. So when, there's, when the data is available and we can differentiate response between ethnicities, we call it out on the report. And unfortunately, most of this data comes from Caucasian populations, and we are getting more and more information in Asian and African populations and these expanded populations. And as we do, we'll add that information into the report. As of now, most of the data is in Caucasians, um, some in Asians, and we're gonna call that out on the report. Each one of these bodies of text relates to the gene in the column next to it. So the lower odds of remission or response relates to that SLC6A4 gene. The second body of text, higher odds of remission or response, relates to the BDNF gene. So we want to tell you what the gene is, what the drug is, and what the relationship between that gene and drug is. Separate from that, it would be nice to know what your expected exposure to a particular drug is? Are serum levels likely to be higher? Are they likely to be lower? Is brain sensitivity likely to be higher or lower? And that's what these arrows represent in that drug exposure column there. And so this one is pretty consistent. Every one of these patients, or every one of these drugs, I should say, is likely to have increased exposure to these medications. And then we list what enzymes and what proteins are responsible for that increase or decrease in exposure. So this replaces our old checkmark system. Uh, something you haven't seen before is what we're calling our drug summary page. So some of the feedback we got about our report was, I, was that I, I would like something more visual. I would like an at-a-glance version of this report. You know, I, I don't have three hours to spend with patients. I want an at-a-glance version. Well, here's your at-a-glance version of the report. So imagine a forest plot. Dr. Stahl showed you a picture of a forest plot before where you had a center line, and then some studies were shifted to the left, shifted to the right. Well, our summary page is modeled after a forest plot. So you have the center line there. Any drug that falls in that center line, consider it neutral. It means we haven't detected any risk genes for this particular drug. So desvenlafaxine, levomonasopran fall in that neutral column. 
use them with standard precautions, standard dosing. Everything else is shifted to the left by different amounts. Shifting something to the left is associated with some type of risk gene. Maybe you have elevated serum levels. Maybe you're expected to have more side effects. Maybe you're expected to have more weight gain with this medication. So drugs are shifted to the left whenever a risk gene is present. The amount by which they're shifted to the left is dependent on how many risk factors there are or how sensitive this drug is to that gene. So I think that's duloxetine. Look at duloxetine in this picture. It's shifted one small unit to the left. So I probably wouldn't be too concerned about duloxetine in this patient. You'll also notice there's an arrow. So in, the reason this medication is shifted to the left is because there's in, expected increased exposure to duloxetine, but it's pretty minor. I wouldn't be too worried about it. Uh, I'd have a different opinion of fluoxetine and peroxetine. They are shifted the farthest to the left, and there's a series of icons there. Not only are these drugs expected to have higher serum levels, but they're expected to have decreased efficacy and increased side effects. So there's multiple risk genes associated with those two drugs. Shift them all the way to the left. So at a glance, if I'm looking at this, I can quickly determine which drugs have the highest risk associated with them. They're probably falling much lower in my treatment choice algorithm than something that has a very small or non-shift to the, to the left. Um, in addition to drug shifting to the left, we can shift some to the right, and if you'll notice in the, the lower left half there, you have a couple of medications shifted to the right, highlighted in blue there. Um, this person happened to have a gene associated with better response to methylphenidate or dexmethylphenidate, so these drugs are shifted, shifted to the right. One thing I should mention here is that all these summary pages are diagnosis specific. Um, we have five of them right now. We have a depression summary page, an ADHD summary page, anxiety, bipolar, and pain management. There's more to come. We're working on PTSD, um, uh, OCD, and schizophrenia, so those will be ready shortly. For now, there's five, and they will be specific for uh, the diagnosis. You have access to all five of the summary pages in our portal, um, but one will be presented on the, on the paper version of the test. Our last new feature here is called our RX Metatype card. So um, think, of, think of this as the, the equivalent to a medical alert bracelet, right? So if you're allergic to penicillin, you wear your little medical alert bracelet. The first responder knows you're allergic to penicillin. Well, what if you're a poor metabolizer at CYP2D6? would be a good idea if the next clinician in line knew that you were a poor metabolizer. So this RX Metatype card here identifies your CYP450 genotypes and phenotypes, and it's meant for the, for the patient to carry with them to their next provider. So we're concerned about Paxil and Prozac and Abilify, and if you're a poor metabolizer at 2D6, there's relevance there. But these patients don't live in a vacuum. They probably also take beta blockers for their high blood pressure. They probably also take Prilosec for their heartburn. And these CYP450 genes are universal. So here's your card. Take it to your next provider. You can't really see it here, but on the back of the card, we provided three links. One of those links is to the FDA table of genetic biomarkers. It's like 89 pages, so if, you, if, you, if you're bored on Sunday, you could read this 89-page FDA document. There are hundreds of drugs that have pharmacogenetic guidance written right into the label. We link to that. We also link to CPIC and all of the CPIC guidelines, and we link to the Indiana University um, homepage that lists different medications and whether or not they are substrates of these different enzymes. So if you're, you know, one of the millions of people who take metoprolol, the most world's most common beta blocker, uh, this link would tell you all the other medications that are metabolized similarly to something like metoprolol. So I mentioned the FDA table of uh, biomarkers, of genetic biomarkers. Well, I just 
pre-selected, I think it's seven or eight drugs here, and these are all drugs that are on our report, but I pre-selected them because I think you would probably be amazed that the FDA labels are really specific in some of the, the pharmacogenetic guidance that they provide. So if you were to open the Abilify label right now, it would say, if you're a 2D6 poor metabolizer, your initial starting dose should be half of what it normally is. If you're a 2C19 poor metabolizer, you should not go above 20 milligrams of citalopram. If you're a 2D6 poor metabolizer, don't go above 10 milligrams of vortioxetine. Very, very specific. And almost every new drug that's hit the market over the last three or four years has this specific FDA pharmacogenetic guidance. In addition to the FDA, I mentioned CPIC before. So CPIC has dozens of guidelines also, pharmacogenetic guidelines. CPIC is largely responsible for standardizing pharmacogenetics. And five years ago, six years ago, it was the Wild West in pharmacogenetics. There was no real standardization to it. Well, now there is. CPIC has standardized terminology. They standardize algorithms. They standardize dosing guidelines and they are widely becoming the, the recognized authority on pharmacogenetics. And so drugs you commonly use, all of the SSRIs except for Prozac has a CPIC dosing guideline. All of the tricyclics have a dosing guideline. Uh, some of the opioids have a dosing guideline and the newest one, atomoxetine, uh, has a dosing guideline, just got published last month. There will, there will be two, two or three more guidelines published this year, um, one for opioids related to OPRM1 um, and a couple of others, but there are dozens of them currently. So talking about some of the levels of evidence for these gene drug pairs, well, um, if, if you don't believe us, you can, uh, the, the FDA will vouch for us because there are 36 drugs on the current report that, that have FDA guidance or FDA warnings in the label related to pharmacogenetics. Um, CPIC, so we have about 32 drugs that have some CPIC guidance. We have 45 drugs that have um, level A or B evidence related to PharmGKB. PharmGKB and CPIC, they're sort of married. Uh, PharmGKB is the database where CPIC derives all their guidelines from. Um, if you prefer European guidelines, the DPWG is Europe's version of CPIC, and we have 18 drugs on the panel that have DPWG guidelines. Um, and if you want to ignore all that, um, all of these genes are backed up by one of three different types of studies, a meta-analysis, systematic review, um, or a GWAS, which is a genome-wide association study. So that's the report. That's our new baby right there. Uh, I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about GDIG again uh, quickly. So GDIG is the Genomine Drug Interaction Guide. Um, and it's probably not named appropriately because it's not just a drug interaction guide. It's a drug gene environment interaction guide. So all of your, one of the criticisms of pharmacogenetics is that it doesn't take drug-drug interactions into account because you can be born a poor metabolizer or a medication can turn you into a poor metabolizer. Paxil turns you into a poor metabolizer. Prozac turns you into a poor metabolizer. And so one of the criticisms was this genetic information is fine, but what you're forgetting about drug-drug interactions. So we said, no, we're not. We got this tool right here. So this marries your genotypes, your CYP450 genotypes, to these drug-drug interactions. It also, two of the inputs you can enter on this are smoking status and coffee consumption. So you, you probably remember that smoking will influence uh, olanzapine serum levels. Well, coffee does too. You gotta drink a lot of it, three or four cups a day continuously as part of your routine. But when you do that, coffee consumption can reduce olanzapine serum levels also. So you click these two check boxes. I'm a smoker. I drink three or more cups of coffee a day, and then it will assess whether or not uh, serum levels of olanzapine or clozapine um, or senapine even are likely to be lower. 
So it marries your pharmacogenetics to drug-drug interactions. Last but not least, remember I was talking about FDA labels before? Look how ridiculously specific this FDA label is right here. So this is, for, this is the Abilify FDA label. And it says, if you're a poor metabolizer, use 50% lower starting dose. But if you're a poor metabolizer and you're taking a strong inhibitor, decrease it by 75%. And if you're on this and that and that and this, decrease it or increase it accordingly. But this is super specific. The newer drug labels are as specific as this is. And so we designed this tool to try to account for all these different parameters. I mean, who could remember this? I've been doing this for five years. I can't remember all of these parameters. But the good thing is the software does it for me. I don't have to remember everything because it, it marries genotype to drug-drug interactions. So just to summarize here, um, we fully recognize that if we, if we throw a report in your lap and say, good luck, have fun with it, figure it out yourself, that it's, it's pretty much useless. So we want to be, we want to partner with you on this. Uh, we provide consults for every report that's done. Many of you I may have consulted with in the past. Um, every report, there's a consult available. That consult does not have to be specific to psychopharmacogenetics. Maybe you're a little rusty with your guidelines. We'll go over the guidelines with you. Maybe you want us to do a GDIG check for you. We'll do that with your patient's drug regimen. So we want to be your partners in this, and we encourage you to use these consults whenever you have a, a new, a difficult patient, or when you're just throwing your hands up in the air and you can't figure out. Um, we're here to help. We want to be your partner. So that's it for me. I'm going to bring back David Krauss and Dr. Stahl, and we'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Do we have a microphone out there? No. no. OK. So if you do have a question, I would just ask you to stand up so we all can hear you, and we'll do our best to answer it. One, one second. Yep. Yes, sir. Um, my question is about the COMP and um, how you might handle a patient that has the MAP test. So the, the question was, if you have COMT, what do you do with a MET-MET patient? So for those of you that aren't that familiar with COMT, COMT is a gene responsible for dopamine metabolism. And it has its biggest impact in the front of your brain, in the frontal cortex. Some of us break down dopamine great. Uh, comped valve valves. That's me. I'm a comped valve valve. I break down dopamine really efficiently. I have lower dopamine levels. Comped met mets, higher dopamine levels. And so the comped genotype tells us a couple of different things. Valve valves have higher response rates and remission rates to stimulants, methylphenidate in particular. Met mets have a comparatively lower response rate to the stimulants. Now, if you look at the data, it's about a 40 to 50% response in MET-METs, 80 to 90% response in valve-valves. So valve-valves do better. MET-METs do significantly worse. You're likely going to need to augment that with something, whatever your level of sensitivity is with that. Maybe you like fish oil as an augmentation agent. There's some data that that's helpful. Uh, but very likely, you'll need to add something to that because your, your overall expected response is about 50%. One of the other things that COMPT tells us, and we're going to add this to the new test, is that um, sensitivity to opioids. The MET-METs are more sensitive to opioids than the valve-valves are, and the valve-valves usually require higher doses of opioids. Dr. Stoll, Dr. Krauss, anything to add? Okay. Did I answer the question? Sammy, so that's a good question. Sammy is a funny one, right? So Sammy might do two different things to the COMPT gene. It might methylate it, which reduces the activity of COMPT, but it also might stabilize it and make COMPT more like a val val. It's not entirely clear what Sammy does. You may remember back in the day we had Sammy on our report and we removed it because new evidence came out showing that what we thought Sammy was doing could be doing something else. So 
in vitro data shows opposite results with SAMe. Also, we've on the Dan showed you the gene drug interaction page or a screenshot of it. We've chosen to include only drugs that have an FDA approved indi indication for a mental health indication or for pain. So there's 125 drugs, 130 brands on the report. So we've eliminated some things from the previous version of the Genesep report. But I have a question for Dr. Stahl. So Dr. Stahl, Dan showed a chart of aripiprazole dosing. And it, it's not just that the dose varies. You have to know what's an inducer, what's an inhibitor, what's a substrate. You're one of the world's expert psychopharmacologists. Do you actually keep all that in your head? Do you know that? I'm not being facetious. I, I'm, I'm being serious. Do you know all the inducers, inhibitors, substrates, or how do you, how do you keep that straight? Well, only partially. The, some of them are more clinically relevant than others. I mean, smoking is a very big deal. Uh, carbamazepine is a very big deal. Um, Rifampin. I mean, there there are some that are a very big deal, but the other ones, it's not clear that they are. So, I try not to clutter myself with too many details and try to not sweat the small stuff. But I have to consult databases not only just because it's a lot of stuff, but it changes, and so nobody can keep up with this as fast as it changes. So, I, I not, the other thing is that is it better to get. Um, forgiveness than permission, which means you just do what you want to do by clinical experience, and when it doesn't work, you start looking stuff up. So it's really when you get an unexpected poor tolerance or unexpected lack of efficacy that in, instead of scratching your head and just going to another drug, but you don't know why you switched, you actually try to figure out what went wrong, and that's when you consult a database. And, and when you, you talked about therapeutic drug monitoring, when you use that tool, when do you get it? So do you get peak levels, trough levels? Do you assume the patient's at steady state? What's your assumptions? Well, in the state hospital system, we have people who don't respond right to their drugs. And so when they don't, after a couple of different trials, possibly with or without clozapine, then we get a trough level. And there are certain drugs that we and the literature and our experience would validate that literature can really tell, and that would be flufanazine levels, haloperidol levels, either risperidone or paliperidone levels, and in fact, if anything, olanzapine and clozapine levels. Short of that, the other drugs, we don't really know how to interpret their levels. But for example, if you are treatment resistant, and you're taking a lanzapine, and most people would say you can't give more than 15, maybe 20 milligrams of it, get a level, and it's a trough level. And usually that's, pragmatically speaking, a lot of people get their drugs at night and they get their level the next day, uh, 12 hours later, but it should be close to the time when you take your next drug dose, but just before you take it. You get that trough level, and the levels you'll see in the literature would say, they should be maybe between uh, 40 and 75. We actually purposely aim for over 125 in those people, and maybe the point of futility is reached at 200 nanograms per ml. That's just one example I'm pulling out of the air. So you would be amazed at how many treatment-resistant psychosis will get better on those levels. And we no longer pay any attention to dose, because it, if I told you the dose of olanzapine that it took, you might fall out of your chair. We're talking about 30, 40, 50, sometimes 60 milligrams, but often 40 milligrams of olanzapine in that case, for example. Um, you find out that in uh, long-acting injectables that it's very hard to get the highest levels that you may need with either risperidone or paliperidone shots. They're very good for moderately ill, but severely ill you have to augment orally or you have to switch to something else. Haloperidol you can blast people with quite a bit. So when you're talking about very sick treatment-resistant patients, we are absolutely dependent on plasma drug levels to tell us where to go. Now, this is state hospital patients. These are the most violent, the most sick, the most uh, dangerous, 
and, and they've, you have to earn this, which means that you have to fail a lot of other stuff, and then you can earn uh, you know, getting levels in high dosing. So say a little louder. In the state hospitals, we don't. Um, we uh, d don't have a budget for that. Right now in the state hospital, we get plasma drug levels. Now, of course, the problem with that is they, they are ch variable. But you could say, well, Stahl, the literature says that plasma drug levels don't correlate with response, and they don't. But if you're treatment resistant, your level over time will correlate very much with the response one after the other. If I do a change in your Haldol dose and you get up to the level above which we're really targeting, you'll have much more likely to get a response because I'm measuring yours, you know, maybe over three weeks or 10 months or two years. So your level means a lot. The level in this room, particularly if you aren't treatment resistant, doesn't mean a lot. So we're really doing it in patients who are treatment resistant. Now, if we had enough money, we would, um, I mean, a plasma drug level costs 50 to $89. So even the state hospital can, can, can uh, you know, to do that. I mean, in the future, what will happen is that we will have that when you're born, you're going to get a heel stick with your blood, and this, your genome is going to be on your electronic medical records, and we'll never have to test it again. But right now, um, we don't have uh, that. So where I get my genotyping, it tends to be in outpatients that are really more cash pay or insurance patients that are not public sector patients and they have more mood disorders than more psychotic disorders. Well, I, I think we've kept you past our appointed hour. Yes. So I'll let Dr. Dowd answer this. I, the question has to do with SLC6A4 short, short genotype and the recommendation on the report with respect to SSRIs and SNRIs. So there's three or four meta-analyses looking at SLC short, short and response to the SSRIs. And the data is pretty consistent that there's either more side effects or a lower response remission rate to the SSRIs. That doesn't occur with the SNRIs. So there's no good data showing that a short short creates a lower response for the SNRIs. SSRIs, yes. SNRIs, no. Mechanistically, that probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but the data shows that SNRIs are not impacted, doesn't cause lower response, lower emission rates, as do the SSRIs. Um, the theory is that somehow that additional norepinephrine uh, reuptake blockade compensates for the SNRIs and they're not as affected by the serotonin deficient, the serotonin transporter deficiency. The thing I would say is don't use your SNRI as an SSRI. And so if you're going to give uh, an SS person an SNRI, kick the dose up so you actually turn it into something else because, as you know, venlafaxine at 75 milligrams is more or less an SSRI. And so uh, the low end of the dosing scale, they're really not any different than an SSRI. So you need to, to push it on up higher. And also, this is in Caucasians, right? Yep. So that, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, the, the strictest thing is in Caucasians that have SSRIs, then that's the closest link to side effects and lack of efficacy. And if you're going to use an SNRI in these people, make sure it's a, a higher dose. I'm going to wrap it up now because we've kept you past your appointed hour. A couple things. If you want to see GDIG, which Dan talked about, the software, which is the Gene Drug Interaction Guide, and if you order GenPro, you'll have access to it on 
a portal that's dedicated to you. But if you want to see it in action, come to our booth because we will be able to show it to you. It's much more visual than a screenshot can show. If you're interested in ordering GenPro for your patients, you can visit our website. And um, I urge you to get your CME credit from the NEI. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stahl.